Good morning, uh, esteemed guests, dignitaries, and participants. Welcome to the second day of the National Conference on Securing Demographic Dividend and Agenda for Change 2024-29. I am Vishal Gaikwad, and it is my privilege to be your compere for the today's enlightening sessions. Yesterday, we embarked on the insightful journey, exploring diverse perspectives and innovative strategies to harness our demographic potential for national progress. Today, we will continue this intellectual expeditions with the renewed enthusiasm and curiosity. Before we delve into the today's sessions, I have a small request for all dignitaries and participants in the interest of time and keep our focus on rich content on the sessions, I kindly ask each one of you briefly introduce yourself so that we will save our time for introduction. Uh, so I'm Vishal Gaikwad. I'm a research fellow at uh, Pune International Center. Thank you. Yeah. Morning this session. I'm, I'm Harshwardhan Singh. I'm uh, with us. Uh, consulting company, small one, called Ikdhwaj Advisors LLP, and I'm associated with some think tanks, uh, including the Pune International Center. Good morning, everyone. I am Chandrahas Deshpande, Professor of Economics at the Wellinkar Institute of Management, Development and Research, Mumbai, and associated with PIC. Thank you. Good morning. I am PC Nambiar. I'm the Director, Senior Minister of India, and also the chairman of the Foreign Trade Committee of MCCIA. Thank you. Vijay Kekar, I'm associate with PIC. Pradeep Mehta, I'm the head of CUTS International. It's a global NGO. I'm Ajit Ranade. I'm currently vice chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune. Hello, uh, I am Dhanamanjari Sathe. I am a professor in economics at the Gokhale Institute, Pune. Uh, I am Abhay Pethe. I am currently associated with Gokhale Institute and PIC. Hello, I am Ayush. I am a senior research associate at the Gokhale Institute. Hello everyone. I am Arpan Ganguly. I am an assistant professor in economics at Flame University in Pune. Thank you. Hello and very good morning to everyone. I am Mehek Sharma and I am a senior research associate at Cuts International. I'm Chutika Patanka. Retired from the IS UP cadre uh, last year and currently associated with the PIC. So, I'm Uh, I'm Bhushana Karandikar. I'm food system researcher, Pune. I am Anil Supnekar, trustee, Pune International Center. I'm Pradeep Apte. I work with PIC and I also teach in Gokhale Institute. Thank you, yeah. Thank you everyone. Today's sessions are meticulously curated to address the crucial aspect of demographic changes, policy implications, and sustainable development strategies. We have a lineup of eminent speakers who will share their insights and research findings, contributing to comprehensive understanding of the demographic dividend and its potential impacts on our future. As we proceed, I encourage everyone to actively engage in the discussion, ask questions, and share your perspectives. Your contributions are invaluable in shaping a collaborative and multidimensional approach to our shared goals. Let's commence today's sessions with a spirit of collaboration and shared vision for a brighter and more prosperous future. Thank you. Uh, let's look forward uh, for another day for stimulating discussions and groundbreaking ideas. So I will request uh, session chair Chandraj Deshpande to take over. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vishal, and good morning, everyone and a warm welcome to everyone to this very important session under the broad theme of uh, securing demographic dividend agenda for change uh, we have uh, 
we have a paper from uh, Harsh, uh, Dr. Harshavardhan Singh and that will be uh, dis uh, discussed by Mr. P. C. Nambiar. Uh, this session is uh, specifically on securing industry future and uh, since industry and trade as we are aware are intrinsically related to each other, we have we look forward to two uh, presentations, one by Dr. Harshavardhan Singh and then that will be followed by the presentation from uh, Mr. Pradeep Mehta on issues of regulation and competition policy. So without any further ado, uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Harshavardhan Singh to proceed with his presentation. Uh, after that, there will be uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, to uh, Mr. Nambiar for his, uh, for his uh, comments as a discussant. Then we will proceed to uh, Mr. Pradeep Mehta's paper, which will also be uh, discussed. And then th there will be about 10 minutes for question and answers. So that will be the schedule. And I would urge everyone to uh, stick, uh, adhere strictly to the uh, timeline. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank the Pune International Center for giving me this opportunity. I keep thinking about trade policy issues. Normally, when trade policy is discussed, people think of just policies at the border. But now, trade policy is a combination of industrial policy, technology policy, uh, in environment policy, etc. Uh, and so one has to take a comprehensive picture. Uh, before, and this is in the context of India. So before we uh, go further into the nitty gritty, uh, we have to see what are the key trade policy objectives of India. So, the Prime Minister of India came out with this uh, concept of At Nirbhar Bharat after Make in India. Uh, people perceived this as, as protectionist, so he explained that this is Make in India for the world. So, the, the trade is an integral part but the focus is on exports. Not only is, did the Prime Minister in his speech in, uh, on 6th August 20, uh, 2021 uh, to Indian mission heads uh, abroad, for the first time in history of India in my view, because India has been a, an export pessimistic country, uh, he said that our objective is to have a large increase in exports and a many-fold increase in India's participation in global value chains. These are two very important objectives he talked about. So, uh, later the Government of India specified what that large increase according to them w should be. It is achieving 2 trillion of exports of goods and services by 2030. Each goods and services be exports being 1 trillion e each by 2030. So there is a, a numerical objective also. As far as manifold increase in contribution of Indian producers to global value chains is concerned, that in some sense is a historic change of Indian perception and engagement with global trade also because we had kept missing the train of global value chains. This is again a, a very important speech because it actually acknowledges that international trade is very significantly conducted by global value chains and we need to be a part of it. So to improve technological uh, uh, potential of domestic industry, make investing in India more attractive because for global value chains, investment is an integral part, therefore the, the investment and uh, trade are two sides of the same coin. Reduce compliance burden because as far as competition in global value chains is concerned, it takes place through cost comp competition, it takes place through timely turnaround because value chain means you import, you process, you export further which is processed, exported further. So timeliness and all the, the policy requirements which delay it or create additional costs 
reduce the, the competitiveness of the uh, producers involved in value chain. And the global value chain is run by so-called lead firms, large firms. They will not look at you seriously if you are not competitive. And what experience suggested is that you need some general policies for efficiency, reducing compliance burden, but you also need to identify priority sectors. So industrial policy, something which, is, which was anathema for a long time in uh, uh, conventional trade policy. Their other objective is to reduce India's trade deficit. And especially trade deficit focuses on goods, which meant that they are focusing on curbing imports and higher domestic production. So this is the background in which India's trade policy objectives have been defined. And uh, the, the, uh, this focus on trade policy, in my view, is misplaced because what this table shows is, you can see merchandise trade deficit is, is high, 7.8% of GDP. But we have a surplus on services. And we have a surplus on transfers from abroad. I have to thank Ajit Ranade for bringing this to my attention in a lecture uh, which was organized uh, in the context of FTA training. Uh, so uh, when you take a look at this, the current account balance is actually quite small. It can be sustained quite easily by a, by a growing economy like India. And if you see the overall balance of payments, India does not really need to worry as much as Indian pl policy planners worry about trade deficit. But why do they worry about trade deficit? My perception is that they are concerned about manufacturing not growing. They link manufacturing with jobs. They know how much the increase in population of India will be. And if they can't provide jobs, the governance uh, of, of the country would have failed. So this is one of the ways to find a solution for that. And therefore, they focus on something which is measurable, which is the trade deficit. There are other trade-related objectives. Uh, after COVID, particularly, having resilient glo global value chains, India has talked about inclusive trade, where you uh, actually not only grow uh, in terms of the aggregate, but you also take others who are left out, who need to be included in that story. So MSMEs, I should have just left everything white, maybe. Can you, can you see what the, the thing? Okay. And in that context, that speech of the Prime Minister is very important. He talks about creating new markets, new products for trade, Today, you cannot really be part of international trade until and unless you address the environmental concerns. If you don't have green products, if you don't have technologies, and then technological change is creating two kinds of uh, uh, situations. One is certain technologies like quantum, et cetera, which, which really change the game. And they are critical to even the security of the country. And one is critical materials which go into sustainable uh, technologies. Both these require a lot of focus, partnerships, and uh, moving forward uh, with uh, a strategy. So uh, te technology is, has become a major part of international trade and partnerships. Now, we take a step back. There's a study by the UK government which has looked at large number of countries, how they will perform in international. There are two studies, actually. One has got 2030 and 2050. I don't want to worry about 2050. And the other has got 2035 and 2050. So, and the projections are meaningful. I mean, they are not unreasonable. Today, India, in terms of goods and services exports, and I'm focusing on exports because exports are the objective of India. But you will see later that imports are crucial for that. You can't have a GVC participation without imports to grow your exports. So 
today india is uh, 2022 india was 12th largest exporter of goods and services by 2030 according to this study india will be the seventh largest doing much better than several uh, who are ahead of india but imports will be fourth largest and you can see 2030 this estimate shows that we are not 2 billion and if we are 1.2 the goods and services themselves haven't reached 1 trillion and the trade deficit is quite large by 2035 according to this study we will be 1.8 trillion fourth largest I looked at the, the rates of growth taken into account for this study. They are slightly underestimating the, they are not based on past performance till today. And actually last two years, India's merchandise trade in particular and services has increased a lot. If you correct by that, you will actually reach number four in 2030 itself. But you will still not be two trillion. You will still have a large trade deficit so there is a question that if India is doing so well, it can be fourth largest exporter. Why should we be worried about policy? Because without policy improvement, you will not achieve the targets you want to achieve. If you don't achieve those targets, the impact on the rest of the economy, inclusiveness, etc., your partnerships, because in a partnership, you have to be a meaningful contributing partner, will not take place then international trade conditions are becoming more complex. India needs to upgrade its capabilities and prepare for that in a manner that it is competitive. There is a middle income trap. There are countries which are outcompeting India in simpler products and India has to make a large effort to break into the technology intensive sectors. And India's presence in global value chains is actually very small compared to all the successful exporters. And one has to make a special political and uh, uh, policy effort to break open the constraints which are today there because of the policy structure. So we need to improve policy initiatives. Uh, policies emphasized by India and other successful nations are broadly similar, except for some key differences. One is tariffs. Second, when you make policy, your work doesn't finish there. You must implement it effectively and efficiently, which other nations do. India does not follow up in a, in a structured manner. Uh, and the approach you give to that policy, you, you, you may reduce the, the compliance burden, but it has to be within a larger framework. You have to have a medium term to long term strategic perspective, which others do. The most uh, uh, important exa examples are uh, Vietnam and China. You have to have uh, a perspective of building links to global value chains where you upgrade your capabilities and this takes time three to five years minimum and how do you manage that you have to see scale of operations increasing we haven't focused on scale at all and scale is the answer to whatever we want to achieve through trade so these are some of the, the gaps in Indian policy making so trade, if you consider GVCs, I talked about cost competitiveness, I talked about timely turnaround. I talk, uh, the third thing is maintaining consistent quality of inputs, output throughout the chain. If that is not consistent, the chain breaks down. All these three must be, must be achieved efficiently. Any policy which adversely affects the efficiency of this is taking the nation the wrong way if you want to connect with GVCs. So that's what we will see now. So these are tariffs. These are, I've looked at uh, non-agriculture tariffs because agriculture trade policy is of a different genre. So if you, the first column is simple average MFN tariffs. 
India's simple average is 14.7 percent. Look at the tariffs of the others. Forget Singapore, which is zero. It's quite small, actually, compared to India, which includes tariffs on inputs. In a value chain, if you increase cost of your inputs, you are actually going to in, uh, uh, make it very difficult for your, your producers to uh, compete in, in the global value chains. Zero tariffs are very important because what happens with zero tariffs is that you don't need to spend time clearing the product with customs. So very quick turnaround is possible. The easiest way to reduce the compliance burden in a customs way is to have a zero tariff. Look at the ratio of tariff lines with zero tariff. If you see some of them, like Thailand is, is 41 percent, you have uh, uh, Malaysia 65 percent, India is 1.8. So in both these, these columns, India stands out as a non-performer or are creating conditions which make it difficult for its GVCs to compete. Then take the look at the third column. How much are you importing from countries with which you have FTAs? Why is this important? Because the, the simple MFN tariff is reduced further in actual fact. And India is 27.8. Look at the numbers for the others. They are quite large. So actual tariffs are very small. I added this call, last column, FTA exports, because this shows what we are competing with. Those countries actually have a much larger access to markets abroad. Today, the question is, earlier we used to think, what will be the damage to India if we take part in FTAs? I think the right question today is, what will be the damage to India if we don't take part in FTAs? So, this is non-tariff measures. You can see from the numbers, uh, the first one is re ratio of tariff lines impacted by non-tariff measures. All countries have higher, most countries have higher, other than the yellows, uh, higher than India. The second one is ratio of trade impacted by non-tariff measures. India is relatively lower compared to others. The third one is, on average, how many non-tariff measures do you impose on a product category? India is right up there. So, when India imposes non-tariff barriers, barriers, it actually imposes several of them on the product category which it imposes. Which actually is shown by, in the WTO, countries report which barriers, non-tariff measures have become barriers and are a specific trade concern to them. Last two years, India was the second largest and the difference is huge between the large ones and the others. EU is the largest and India was the second largest. F for the period 95 to 2022, India was the third largest. So actually, India is quite protectionist when it does use its NTMs. And what does that do? It reduces, it increases the time of turnaround, it increases the cost of compliance, and it prevents you to connect efficiently with, your, with the imports, which are important inputs. This is trade facilitation index. The yellow ones are those where all the others, most of the others actually have a better situation compared to India. The other colored one is Vietnam, where Vietnam is better than India. Now you'll see that for most, Vietnam is not better than India, but the ones I have colored, Vietnam is better. And what are they? Appeal procedure, fees and charges, procedures, and the last one is not as important, but fees and charges and procedures are conventionally known to affect your cost competitiveness. And why did I pick Vietnam? Because Vietnam is a place where investors go to. So we are if, if we are worse off than Vietnam, we have to improve these. 
because the, in that situation we are actually creating a weight around our neck so all these three show areas which need to be improved the other thing is if you see china is better in in several areas but vietnam not so but actual fact what vietnam does is it talks to the lead firms in the sectors which it has prioritized it asks them what they need and in a focused way provides it if efficiently so this table need not give vietnam the numbers which in general would be true for the economy but for large players vietnam is a very f facilitating environment therefore costs are much less in fact i asked a large electronics firm why it went to vietnam it said we'd calculate the cost of production uh in countries we are going to after leaving china or in addition to china we calculated this for five countries vietnam was the lowest it was 4% higher than china the highest was 25% it was mexico so as it is vietnam's cost are lower then they they negotiate conditions which make it even better new and emerging trade related conditions i'll first go with slow global growth as a concern uh so this gives you the world output projections you can see that the projections for next year uh, it's slightly lower than this year however india has done reasonably well in output next you see that the world trade volume you can see emerging markets developing economies exports india comes in that category this year was not that good but next year is supposed to bounce back so that is the forecast this is the october forecast of imf uh, quite recent in this background let's see how india's trade has done this year january to october actually overall trade has not gone down merchandise exports have gone down but services exports have gone up immensely therefore they have made up in oh, okay they have made up in 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 a big way imports have gone down so if you see the overall trade deficit th this year till october is lower than last year but we should not focus on de deficit is the wrong issue to focus on i showed you the balance of payment thing so let's forget that let's just see how trade has done and merchandise trade has performed badly but next year it's expected to rebound we can increase that rebound with good policy change now global partnerships so the what is happening in the world there there are two categories one which require india to get into major partnerships and second where india has to make the effort itself partnerships are not the answer they may help but they are not the answer so geopolitical issues gvc resilience new partnerships which are emerging to be part of that like ipf reducing large dependence on on single or limited sources of input so national security issues improving access to new technologies and inputs unilateral trade measures when they are being taken how to respond to that partnerships become a major part of the answer future global emergencies like covid and cyber security issues all these require partnerships and india is actually taking an active part in this if you take a look and you see the countries which are given uh, in the terms of reference i was asked to suggest which countries india should be partner with actually i think india is doing a good job in terms of the countries and approach and linkages and being part of partnerships so it's not that india is not in touch with the right countries what becomes crucial is how to make that more useful for india that is what we need to think about so these are 
you know, it has two major uh, initiatives with EU and and US. I have given some some areas. It covers all the right kind of areas. This is a set of issues where if India does not work domestically on it, and these are emerging issues, we will not be part uh, of the uh, dynamic traje tra trajectory. So standards, you know, now in, in the EU, especially Germany, they are asking for due diligence. You have to see various factors are met in your, your value chain. They are asking for uh, uh, addressing, uh, you know, the, the, there are new laws uh, dealing with digital, there are new laws dealing with uh, standards, they, they are, uh, there are conditions uh, in the digital context which are changing the manner in which international trade is conducted. The framework with which we approach international trade till now will not be the framework with digital methods becoming the dominant methods. We have to, to understand what it is and prepare our policy environment for that. So these are some of the issues where emerging concerns are such that we are really not prepared for that. A major effort is required and that is needed domestically, together with others, but domestically is the key. So, <clears throat> for that we require a medium to long term strategy. We require, we, it's interesting that several existing initiatives of India actually address these concerns, but it's not working. I, I was working on something where one of the aspects was Nari Shakti, that was the, the chapter. And India has l several policy initiatives to uh, uh, encourage women to become part of global trade, value chains, etc. But they are not working. Why? We have to take a look at our existing policies and see what needs to be dropped, what needs to be improved, etc. So there are things we need to do in order to improve the efficiency and identify the key policies. Then another aspect for us is the impact of China. Here, PIC has already done a lot of very good work. What I, I did was to identify, in terms of trade, which are the sectors, if they are, which actually stand out. So, if you take a look at two-digit HS categories, three of them account for the largest part of uh, imports from China, largest part of the trade deficit with China. So these are 84, 85, and 29, organic chemicals and machinery and electronics. If you take a look at the details of this, 82% of the trade deficit of 84, 85 is due to electronics. We already have some policy initiatives for electronics, including PLI, etc. If you implement them properly, I think we are on the right path there. PLIs, just because the name is PLI, some are working, doesn't mean every PLI is working. You need to evaluate the effectiveness of them. The others, you may look at them, not look at them, but if you just address the first three, and organic chemicals includes the APIs, etc. So the organic chemicals sector has to be dealt with in a different way where you take a interconnected approach rather than uh, uh, an approach of addressing key constraints. It has to be a, a strategic approach with organic chemicals. Last, this is my last slide. So, India has increased tariffs in order to uh, increase domestic production and the impact of that is you lose efficiency. If you lose efficiency, you're not part of the global value chain, so domestic production doesn't go up. The one policy which consistently addresses both efficiency and increase in domestic production, which other successful countries have focused on, is increase in scale. Here you can see that if you reduce the costs of your inputs, 
through reducing in tariffs on inputs. You actually increase production, you increase investment. Once increase in investment takes place, scale increases. Scale increases, the domestic ecosystem starts developing. That starts developing, then you are able to produce effectively at home. Domestic production takes place or doesn't take place for two reasons. One, you don't have the skill and technology. Second, the demand at home is not large enough for somebody to invest in that product at home. So when the scale increases, the demand increases. So scale, how to increase that scale, how that requires efficiency is the key to the trade issues. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Harshwardhan Singh, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, may I request Mr. Nambiar to uh, offer his views for about 8 to 10 minutes? Thank you. Let me compliment Dr. Ashwadhan Singh for an exhaustive and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation of the policies. According to me, the form, you know, formulating a policy is the simplest thing. Basically, what happened to us, and if you look at the you know, Indian perspective, <coughs> Being the federal setup, what we have, synchronizing the national commitment and national policy with the state governments, because we need to really implement the policies through the states. So this there is a, a disconnect with reference to various state policies, which are with the central government policies. So any policy uh, formulator probably will have to have certain uh, you know pre-policy preparation with the state government to understand what are the strength and weakness and what are the potential and how do we go about it, get them into the fold of the policy formulation scheme, then it can be implemented very fast. Now, they, he said that scaling up is one of the major issue. How do you scale up? For example, today semiconductor, which have been done in Gujarat, only why in Gujarat? Why not any, elsewhere? So is that we don't have water? Three, three, you know, two thirds of the Indian is uh, in water basically so yeah, creating water for that that technology is not very difficult but probably there should be an willingness for the state government to do that now there is a political theology which says the automation and uh, technology you know adaptation would also reduce the you know the employment opportunities there is a you know whether we accept or we don't accept it's a reality there is a resistance in adopting the technology in its full strength. So we need to look at that, you know, we educate them. And similarly, what I find is that, you know, the, we have various policies. Now, for example, for the first time in the last year, we have a district level expert promotion council created to focus on each, state, each district, the potential and what are the policy support required, how do we implement it. But that those schemes are there, but there is no monitoring system. There is no because I am a member of the Pune, you know, District Expert Promotion Council, and I think that even attendance is very few. Hardly two people come, and uh, first com first meeting was very good. After that, nothing. So we started out the program. There's a policy. There's not an absence of policies. Not the policy is there, but how do we implement? How do you make that? state or district collector accountable for implementation of the scheme. So we need to, you know, at a local government level, we need to educate the importance of that their activity and how does it, you know, uh, the positively impact on our uh, trade, you know, national trade. And the uh, export is, merchandise exports, if you look at that defense exports, so, you know, we are first up, you know, for the first time we opened up we done very well. And if you look at that, if you open up the, you know, the more restricted area for, you know, export uh, market, there's possibility that we can achieve. That has been shown by the export, you know, the defense equipment, export figures that we enter. Need to, we, are, we, we can behave very differently. When you go pandemic, I'm from Serum Institute of India. I, you know, we exported the vaccine, COVID vaccine in uh, 50, 51 countries in a short span of time. The initiative taken by the central government, if that made it a habit of the government, they would think they would be different. The reason being, when I want to export to uh, some vaccine to Africa, 
and we you know they did not give the packing you know the size of the aircraft we sent the vehicle from here with our normal packing it went to bombay we could not fill you know fitting into the aircraft the aircraft was small so immediately we called that nodal officer in delhi saying that madam the uh, aircraft cannot take it i said do one then take it back and make a smaller uh, boxes i am getting another aircraft now within a you know, short span of time next aircraft came if that in pandemic situation if we can behave well like this why don't we make this as a habit and ensure that export is in priority sector we need to attend come what may we need to provide the global chain you know management in that, that respect if we educate if we are able to we have proved that we have the capability but we need to be we need to be in a pandemic situation to behave well so probably we need to that and is the you know the all those uh, fta we have number of fta I, you know dr harshwardhan singh said that we have the connection we have a lot of agreements but do we really monitor that fta and in on periodical basis do we modify that with you know with the being and having an fta is not the issue whether do you get the benefit of fta so we, whether we have a monitoring system can we change that shopping list from uh, back and forth and also try to you know modify that so the policy formulation is easy but formulation the policy implementation should be a 365 days 24 hours you know uh, assignment given to the policy maker to review and remodel and uh, you know uh, to uh, till we achieve that you know the uh, desired objective we should not take rest thank you thank you very much uh, mr nambiar for those very crisp observations highlighting the necessary role of the state governments uh, in terms of enhancing our export capability as also interpersing interspersing it them your observations with some harsh ground realities so thank you very much uh, uh, do we take some questions now or we go to the okay so uh, we'll go to the next presentation may i request mr pradeep mehta uh, to kindly come forward and make his presentation he will be he will be speaking on towards uh, uh, competition policy and regulatory reform <coughs> good morning and uh, thank you very much i would like to thank the pune international center and the other co organizers of this event which includes cuts uh, for having invited me to speak to you on a subject which is uh, one of my favorites. And it, in fact, uh, segues from Harsh's last slide when he spoke about the domestic ecosystem. So this is all about the domestic ecosystem uh, on which uh, uh, I wish Harsh had spent a little more time, but I suppose the time is always a limitation. Having said that, uh, uh, next please. Sorry. Right. Uh, see, as we all know, I mean, <laughs> we have graduated from a centrally planned economy, a socialist mixed economy, where the government controlled uh, the key sectors like heavy industries, transportation, electricity, etc., etc. Uh, this is up to 1990s, I would say. And the private sector operated under government control in limited areas uh, with licenses, quotas, and high tariffs. Post-1985, in fact, the first liberalization began under the regime of Rajiv Gandhi, uh, which is in bits and pieces. A uh, little bit before that, we saw in the uh, regime of, uh, I forget who, uh, but when uh, Yashun Sinha was our uh, finance minister. So there were earlier signs of uh, reforms uh, which we could see. But the, the, the atmosphere, the ecosystem was not ready to accept most of the reforms for several reasons. Uh, I think uh, inertia, legacy, etc., etc. Now, 
We could see from 1991 onwards, the targeted reforms were seen in various sectors, such as the introduction of the SEBI Act 1992, the Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999, the Competition Act 2002, and the Electricity Act of 2003. And in 2017, the GST was introduced. As many of us have said, the GST was the first FTA with India. <laughs> So that was quite an effort, and as uh, Vijay was telling us last night, this was the fastest introduction to GST as compared to many other countries. We did do that. It took much longer time in spite of the fact that uh, we also had problems. The uh, fact is that we are a federal country, a quasi-federal country to be more precise, and states had to be brought on board uh, under various, uh, uh, no, <coughs> various sort of reasons given for the benefit. Uh, so far, uh, what it shows is that overall there has been a great increase, expansion in our uh, gross receipts, uh, gross income, uh, as a consequence of the GST. Now, the, if you look at the political economy around competition and regulatory developments, uh, uh, we were plagued with piecemeal and ad hoc approach to these uh, regulatory reforms and competition reforms. The Competition Act was a replacement of the old MRTP Act, which was, a, uh, which was in fact a millstone around the neck of the industry. It did not allow you to produce uh, the 10,000 and first widget if your license was for 10,000 widgets. That is a kind of, you know, just to take you in the background of where we stood. Uh, now, once again, if you look at some of the regulatory reforms, I'm particularly talking about economic regulation. Uh, we had uh, varieties of approaches to uh, various uh, telecom regulatory authority of India, for example. The first time in the world a whole act was abandoned or, or repealed uh, because to get rid of the uh, very uh, <coughs> rule-following chairman and deputy chairman, uh, <laughs> Justice Sodi and uh, and B.K. Zushi. It was so funny. I mean, they, 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 of course, did not understand political economy, if you ask me honestly, that we could see the ridiculous uh, level when the tribe went to the Supreme Court against DOT, or DOT went against the tribe to the Supreme Court. I mean, that is the kind of stupidity we could see in our country. The things which should have been resolved at the policy level had to go to the court. But the fact is that uh, both Zuchi and Sodi followed the rule book so uh, strictly that uh, the act was abandoned. And a new act was, uh, which included bringing in the TDSAT, the Telecom Dispute and Settlement Appellate Tribunal. I'm just giving you this example, one particular example to show the kind of uh, ups and downs we had in a regulatory structure. Funnily, uh, none of these regulatory laws had any commonality in terms of terms, etc., etc., except the fact is that they all promoted a cartel of retired IS officers. And all the regulatory positions, uh, Information Commission, Consumer Commission, everything was headed by retired, uh, save and except try in two cases only, a banker and a former SEBI chairman. But th that, th that was an exception. Today, fortunately, SEBI has a non-IS officer. But overall, you find that, so we had this kind of very peculiar thing, and most of them, with due respect, did not understand the economics of regulation. They knew more about control. So, in fact, mostly, I mean, look, PNGRB, the Petroleum Natural <coughs> and Gas Regulatory Board, for example, provided a very peculiar example, uh, headed by Labyandu Man Singh, who had retired as Consumer Affairs Secretary, and he thought he's, he continues as Secretary. And therefore, his other members are additional Secretaries rather than of the same level as he is. Then again, again, a vichitra thing happened, <laughs> peculiar thing. Both the members went to the Supreme Court again, Labindu Mansi. I mean, those are the kind of, uh, you know, uh, oddities which happened in our approach and now, for example, another very peculiar thing which happened was the chairman of TRI had a limited term, like any other chairman of any commission, and would not be, uh, was not allowed to take any post-retirement uh, post, post uh, 
job, double post. But in the case of Nipin Mishra, another very dear friend of mine, very competent person, Narendra Modi brought in an ordinance to appoint him as his principal secretary. An ordinance just to appoint one single person because of the kind of legal infirmity which existed. And there are many such examples. But I just wanted to highlight some of these examples to show what happened. Competition law, for example, 2002. As a replacement of the MRTP Act, the Supreme Court struck it down. It says it cannot be headed by a bureaucrat, it has to be headed by a judge, a retired judge. Again, my mind you, the, the, the debates are always about retired people and not active people. <laughs> this is a big tragedy in our country in terms of our regulatory regime. I and Vijay have written many articles on it jointly also. Now, in that particular case, since the MRTP Commission was headed by a retired High Court judge, the Supreme Court held that the Competition Commission should also be held by a retired judge. Not of the High Court, but of the Supreme Court, because Competition Commission of India is a higher body. For seven years, the, Co the Competition Act was not implemented. For seven years. Look at the, I mean, look at the joke which happens in our country and the way how the policy approaches take place, captured very neatly by Vijay and Ajay Shah in, in their book, uh, in, in service of the Republic, uh, the ambiguities in law which exist. I, I can go on and on. Now, fortunately, the <coughs> Competition Act was amended to create a competition appellate tribunal and the Competition Commission was a kind of a trade-off between the bureaucracy and the judiciary. They find we are creating a tribunal to be headed by a judge which will, to which the Competition Commission will be accounted even if it is headed by a retired ba Babu. And that is what happened. Tragically, the Competition Appellate Tribunal has been uh, dissolved. And its functions have been handed over to the National Com Com Company Law Appellate Tribunal. For a long time, competition cases could not be adjudged at the appellate level because the NCLAT did not have time. Finally, they have created a bench for competition cases. But what I'm saying is these are issues which are so important for us to ensure, to see as to how our regulatory reforms are being implemented. Uh, Deshpande Sahib, you spoke about implementation. Yeah, so there you are. The implementation itself is so bad uh, which you know, which then uh, negates uh, the 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 intent and the purpose of the particular legislation, and therefore I would say that uh, uh, you'll find uh, these kind of problems even in terms of allocation of subsidies and support prices aimed at enhancing welfare and the exploitation by interest groups of their interests. Now. What is my surmise that we could have done far better if all these issues were approached in a systematic way. Uh, but, you know, our progress was affected because of that. Uh, we don't look at what we missed, as Harsh pointed out in his own, uh, you know, if you wish, a question I wanted to ask Harsh, which I will do. Now, because there's still an influence of socialist policies. Many of the bureaucrats still have that East India Company syndrome even today. Though they are, they've been born in, in the post-independence era and they've worked mostly in the post-independence era, but they have received wisdom, quote, unquote, from their seniors who have grown up in that particular thing. Vijay and Harsh have dealt with them while they were in the uh, government. So I think they can, uh, can believe what I said. Now, what are the key challenges which are withholding competition regulatory reforms today? First is jurisdictional. Overall, sectoral regulators play a crucial role uh, by employing a proactive approach uh, ex ante, whereas competition authorities uh, are primarily use a reactive approach ex post, except in the case of merger review, where they have an ex ante approach. Now, there is a conflict between both of them. That conflict we've still not been able to resolve for, again, ego reasons. One very interesting case I must tell you, ULIP, sorry, uh, uh, Unit Linked Insurance Plan, 
was to be regulated by the by SEBI or IRDA. And there was a conflict between them which went to the Bombay High Court. Here again, I'm showing you another instance with two regulators and the Bombay High Court very wisely and sanguinely told them, that, look, you should resolve this issue outside the court. SEBI said it's an investment product, so it's our regulation. The IRDA said it is insurance link product, so therefore it is our regulation. And you know what the inside story was? Again, a consequence of the retired IS bureaucracy. One was of a batch senior than the other, and they said, how can that person you know, tell, do what I am saying that? This is what the Secretary to the Government of India told me. I just give you an example of kind of the consequences of some of these inanities that we see in our regulatory reform. It doesn't happen anywhere in the world, except in India. I mean, India is unique. Now, we talk about optimal regulation or smart regulation, which is again a, <coughs> a very big ask, I would say. We expect that the competition regulator and sector regulators work in tandem, frequently communicate and share feedback. Now, the very interesting uh, phenomenon is I tell you between, in terms of conflict between a uh, sector regulator and a uh, competition authority. The Banking Regulation Act was being amended, and there was a cry, like many other sectors, that look, we want exemption from the Competition Act. What nonsense. If two banks are colluding, how can they be exempted from the Competition Act? I can't go to the Reserve Bank of India with a complaint against a cartelization act. They agreed, and finally they agreed that fine, even mergers will be dealt with only by the banking regulator, Reserve Bank, and not by the competition authority. Finally, with a lot of advocacy that we did, we succeeded. Ashok Chawla was then the secretary, who was a very wise man. That, look, you can only talk in terms of merger review or takeover review of failing banks and not of active banks. They have to go to the Competition Commission of India. And that was what was agreed, uh, which in any case uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a common practice in, under the Competition Act anywhere in the world. That failing, what is called the failing firm defense. If the firms are failing, then you don't look at you know, whatever violation they might do in terms of the conditions, etc., etc. This is giving you an example of the kind of problem that we faced in the past. The other problem is there is limited structural, functional, and financial autonomy with competition regulatory agencies. Another friend of mine, the first non-IS officer, uh, the first chairperson of Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, uh, S.L. Rao, Surin Rao, uh, told me, he said, Pradeep, you want to buy a pencil, I have to go to Shram Shakti Bhavan, where the power ministry is. I mean, what he was trying to say was symbolically Everything was so, you know, sort of suffocating that he couldn't do anything on his own, in spite of being the chairperson of that particular authority. But that was the first and the last time that the central electricity regulator ever was he headed by a professional. For many times, we pushed the case of Harsh and other good economists like Ajit, Ajay Shah, etc., you know, to be appointed chair of regulators or, or uh, of competition commission. Nobody listens. There is a clear cartel and a, a kind of a, you know, the whole cabinet is uh, infested by them. Now, so, now, there is another very interesting aspect is that we worked on a competition policy for the country under a committee appointed by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, headed by a former chairperson of Competition Commission of India, Dhanendra Kumar. In 2011, we came out with an excellent competition policy. Competition policy is basically what? See, we, competition law can only take action against anti-competitive anti practices which are not sanctioned by law. But many anti-competitive practices which are sanctioned by law cannot be challenged under the Competition Act. For that, you require a, a policy approach, which will deal with policy. Let me give you an example. Today, we have liberalized insurance sector in the country. But LIC is the only co company which has a sovereign guarantee. 
other private players who have entered the market do not get a sovereign guarantee. Isn't that an unfair, just, you know, you're creating an unlevel playing field. But there are other factors also, the LIC is still the biggest life insurer because of its extensive reach and the infrastructure. But the fact is, I'm giving you one small example, and there are various such examples where we talk that if there is an absence of competitive neutrality in the country. And Mr. Nambia, you would know, there are cases of reverse competitive neutrality also in the country, which is a consequence of corruption. Our Hapkins vaccine laboratory was shut down on some silly grounds called uh, good lack of good manufacturing practices. And there was no given good reason given ever as to why it was shut down. Where was the problem with the lab, etc.? There was vested interest of private vaccine manufacturers. I don't know whether the Serum Institute was one of them. Could have been of having, you know, <laughs> pushed <laughs> to close down a excellent public sector setup. Indian Airlines suffered quite a lot because Praful Patel, then Civil Aviation Minister, favored Jet Airways. And now they're facing an inquiry. Jet Airways is still in pro problem. Indian Airlines could not buy a single aircraft in spite of so many committees which had recommended the same because the minister kept on blocking acquisition of aircraft while Jet Airways and Kingfisher continued to expand. These are cases of what we call reverse competitive neutrality, but that is a result of a governance deficit rather than a policy decision as such, except that the minister could block it. Now, what we have explained here is competition policy has to deal with many of the of the policy-induced anti-competitive outcomes, which cannot be sanctioned under any law except when there is a specific law. I have given you various examples of the policies that we have to deal with in terms of the governance, economic governance of a country. Yeah, uh, let me see. What is the global experience on competition policy and regulatory reforms? Uh, sector regulator and competition regulator. Now, EU has the best approach where they have made it mandatory that both the sector regulator and the competition authority should cooperate in dealing with a particular case. One cannot say that I have the exclusive jurisdiction. Now, in many cases, the competition authority itself has sector regulation embedded in it, like Spain, Netherlands, New Zealand, Estonia, and Australia. In India, which has spoken at length, and uh, we have recommended a cooperative and collaborative approach, but still not happening. The Competition Policy Committee, which I referred to, made a very clear recommendation. And every time we go to the parliament for the, with the competition amendment bill to include it as a mandatory provision, they don't do it. Anyway, now, what are the key reforms required? And this, uh, Chairman, I would conclude with this. Uh, Regulatory impact assessment. We talk in terms of ease of doing business. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, I and Mehak, my co-author of this uh, paper, uh, we are writing another paper. Uh, what we've seen is that ease of doing business is mainly doing with dealing with approvals and permits to start a business. It doesn't talk about blockades or handicap which entrepreneurs face when running a business. So we are writing another paper called Ease of Running a Business. <laughs> which again is also cost, cost of running a business. Now, secondly, effective coordination between competition and regulatory agencies so that they all work towards a common purpose, a shared purpose, which that, that thinking is missing, unfortunately. Yeah. They have a forum of Indian regulators, but the competition agency doesn't participate in that. I mean, there again, I mean, the egos that we have in our uh, uh, country is, is a big problem. Using technology, no-brainer. Convergence, now, an important thing is the convergence between trade and industrial policies, competition, trade, and investment. We have done a study for Department of Industries, uh, Harsh, where we've looked at the kind of problems that they lack in terms of convergence between trade policies and industrial policy. And we end up into, for example, inverted duty structure, which you didn't mention. I mean, it's, it's a big problem we face today in India's, India's trade policy regime. Thank you. 
And uh, let me end with one question to Harsh, uh, which I wanted to ask. Uh, Harsh, has somebody looked at the, the trade diversion of India not being a member of RCEP or any other agreement? For RCEP, I'm told uh, that there is a lot of trade diversion happening. Uh, but this is something you two mentioned in passing uh, in your own presentation, that kind of uh, what, what you lose by not being in a, a particular arrangement. But I'm looking at a particular RCEP because it's, it's still in being debated. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I would like to thank the uh, organizers for um, giving me a chance to discuss this paper. Thank you, Dr. Pradeepan, uh, for your talk. Like, really insightful. I really enjoyed reading the paper and learned a lot as well. So, um, uh, I'll begin a little bit with the importance of the work that you have laid out and you know some of the contributions. I think recognizing these jurisdictional overlaps is, I think, one of the most strongest contributions that uh, of your work here. I think this is often uh, not in in academic work. We often tend to ignore that. So recognizing that and the kind of examples you have given to flesh it out is really, really insightful. And we, I think, uh, at the policy level, a lot of uh, brainstorming should be happening in fixing these judicial, uh, jurisdictional overlaps, recognizing what they are and addressing it. Uh, the other important contribution I uh, recognize is that uh, the, when you are discussing that industrial re uh, development requires a balance between competition and well-defined industrial policy. I think often we see these policies working in isolation or treated in isolation, but all these multiple overlaps of different kind of policies together needs to work in one direction to achieve um, industrial development. Um, so going into a little bit of my comments on some thoughts that I had, I mean, the approach to competition in the paper uh, uh, deals with the idea of looking at competition in the domain of, or from the sphere of exchange. And um, we also have the dimensions of uh, the sphere of production and the sphere of distribution. So when we lay out uh, competition policy the way you have structured it out, uh, and how it can affect other labor, labor outcomes and industrial outcomes, etc., uh, I think um, it seems like competition policy then subsumes aspects of production and distribution. So I think recognizing the link between competition and distributional consequences seems to be a little understudied or uh, under focus sometimes. Because how um, uh, competition affects the conflict between profitability versus wage growth. This, the distributional impacts of that I think is somewhere also important to recognize. Um, and when, especially in a market like India, we have a, it is, I mean, contrary to um, economic textbooks which teach us about perfect competition, we know that we live in an environment of imperfect competition and also recognizing those, that dimension, uh, the role of, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the economists I really admire reading, Piero Srafa, often talks about the, you know, when we understand competition, we need to understand imperfect competition, the role of monopoly profits, the shifting of profitability across sectors. So th those, uh, that leads to the idea that in imperfect competition, uh, complete, imperfectly competitive markets, we have, the, um, leads to exclusionary uh, kind of dynamics. Ma markets become exclusionary. Um, if you're unable to pay, um, you know, buy something as a consumer at a certain price, you're pretty much excluded from, the di uh, from participating in that market or benefiting from it. So the exclusionary nature of markets and imperfect competition maybe needs to be further recognized. Um, you discussed uh, very insightfully the benefits of competition policy and laid down different markers, which were very uh, important. Uh, I just was thinking while reading that probably the complementarities between these different items is also important. Like, for instance, product quality and innovation is, a, is something that is very tied together. To, in, in order to improve productivity, uh, product quality, we need to also worry about upgrading technology and innovation. Uh, and innovation often tends to be a very costly and uncertain process with a lot of failure. You can, uh, people invest in innovation, but sometimes they don't come about. So there's a cost to it and a role of policy there as well. Um, the other aspect I was thinking about um, is the conflictive nature of competition between big and small capital, larger capitalists versus small capitalists. How do we go about thinking about that from a policy perspective? 
um, because we also see a growing trend towards capital concentration or large more mergers acquisitions and so how do we think of the com a competition policy that is taking into account both small and large capitalists and their profitability and their growth um, uh, the other dimension was that of with respect to competition policy is is the um, is regarding domestic versus global competition. So creating a competition policy that addresses national interests of comp uh, nationally competitive and creates a nationally uh, competitive environment, but at the same time deals with the threats and uncertainty that global competition poses or that Indian industrialists face with respect to engaging in global uh, leaders. Um, because the technological frontier is set by these, um, you know, uh, by large firms, lead firms in global value chains in the, uh, other countries, and they offer, um, you know, by the time we are catching up, they are moving on further in terms of, um, you know, pro uh, the product or the technologies that they offer. So it's like a, the goal keeps shifting, the, the, the global goal keeps shifting, so we need to constantly keep catching up. So that becomes a challenge. Um, in terms of linking competition policy with trade, um, you suggested, a, you know, an environment where um, restri like restrictive kind of regulatory barriers should be removed or, or should be addressed and tackled with. Um, uh, and, you know, how we participate and engage with global supply chains. I think the issue here is global ch supply ch value chains by uh, supply chains by its very nature is hierarchical. If by its very nature is based you know, promotes or, yeah, promotes unequal exchange. So in that context, what matters is strategic selective integration, strategic selective openness, and not a blanket idea of openness somewhere, maybe, perhaps. Uh, final comment would be that of linking competition with industrial industrialization policy. And uh, I fully recognize your comment that competition policy would is something that could aid uh, the virtu a virtuous cycle of industrialization, but I think uh, several commentators on Indian economy, Indian economy scholars have recognized that we are facing a deindustrialization process. The manufacturing output and manufacturing employment has been shrinking. So if that I if there is a environment of where industrialization is not growing as such, and there's a, some kind of deindustrialization that we see in you know, other developing countries like Africa, we are already, or Latin America, if a, such a process does exist, like scholars like R. Nagraj explicitly talk about this process in the Indian context recently, then that suggests that this whole structural change process has been fractured and industrialization has not, you know, there's a process of deindustrialization. In that context then, how do we under, uh, achieve a virtuous cycle of industrialization when to begin with it's kind of fractured somewhere? Uh, that, those are my comments. Thank you so much. I re really uh, look forward to participating in the rest of the conference. Look forward to hearing your thoughts, Dr. Pradeep Mahath as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Atman Ganguly. Uh, both the uh, presentations together have raised uh, we have raised some very pertinent issues uh, uh, with respect to their contemporary economic relevance. And I'm sure the kind of gathering we have here would have, uh, almost every one of them would have come up with some, raising some critical issues and questions. So without any further ado, may I uh, request the, uh, the participants to uh, kindly raise their specific questions. We have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Yeah, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Ajit Ranade. Thank you very much. I just also, uh, sorry, before you begin, uh, please also let uh, let us know uh, to whom the question is addressed, either to Dr. Harsha Subhardhan Singh or... I have a specific question for Mr. Arsha. Uh, thank you for the very comprehensive and also thank you Pradeep Mehta. Very specific question since the deliberations of this conference are going as collective input into a document which is going to be uh, given to the various political parties in light of the fact that we have national elections. What specific recommendation would you make on RCEP? Because the window is still open, Japan is still inviting and I don't think anything has changed. So what specific recommendation? Yes, please, please, please go ahead. Uh, this is a question to, uh, uh, to... This feedback is because one, one rogue mic is there. 
There is one rogue mic, which this is a electrical engineering in the. There is one rogue mic which is on. Maybe the yeah. others are all okay. So, specific question to Professor uh, to Mr. Pradeep Mehta. Uh, he has been harping on competition policy, not just competition law, for last I don't know 30 years. And uh, he gives examples of Australia's approach, which was, they used to call it the Productivity Council, then I think it became the Competition Council Commission. Commission. And so uh, the question to you is, uh, why don't we have a strong confidence and belief that competition is good for the Indian economy? When we as parents uh, put our kids, you know, the, the soft underbelly of everybody, bureaucrats or private sector, is their progeny, you know, getting admissions in good schools. So we don't, uh, we are game for this competition. You know, it's deathly and it, many people die. <laughs> JE, school admissions, uh, UPSC. So we, we actually, we, do, we don't complain against competition. I mean, it's very, sometimes it's really bad. So therefore, I don't think it's in the Indian psyche that competition gives you good outcomes. But when it comes to competition policy as the central, uh, sort of uh, central philosophy to guide all policies in India, including, I remember you said, even fiscal and monetary policy, you should think about it. So somehow there is a distrust because they feel that someone somewhere is going to, uh, the, le the, level, the playing field is never level. Some of the big crony capitalists are going to, you know, tilt it in their favor. So it's better to have a lot of government. And so I think I'm just want to know if you have any thoughts on why we don't trust competition policy. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Okay. Kate. First, I want to join uh, Ajay to congratulate both uh, Harsha and uh, my friend uh, Mr. Mehta for outstanding presentations. I only one uh, question or to our Harsha can he can uh, respond now and even later on. If you want to send it, I didn't. Uh, do you have do you have any suggestion about institutional reforms? What I mind was uh, one could argue that uh, given India stake. India should probably play a larger role in strengthening the military system. For instance, w India should play a larger role in strengthening the military system. And for instance, WTO we should be at the... Uh, but for that, you have to become yourself a good citizen. And what are the domestic reforms required? For instance, we are probably the most egregious users of anti-dumping, uh, which really erodes our credibility. As a use use anti-dumping, anti yeah. uh, which is really uh, regressive in terms of our reputation in the, uh, uh, the global institution system. Similarly, is there any possibility of, uh, uh, I mean, this is a naive probably proposal, but any possibility of uh, creating some of the independent institutions uh, like uh, International Trade Commission in the US, for instance, which uh, gives much greater analytical support. But uh, the thing is on these lines, are there any institution would you like to stress stagnant? I think uh, my suggestion would be, uh, since uh, quite a few issues have been raised both by Dr. Ajit Ranade and by Dr. Vijay Kekar, may uh, I think it's uh, an opportune time for uh, both of you to respond, and then maybe we can collect some further questions. Uh, can can we go back to my presentation, please? So, meanwhile, uh, I'll address the questions which uh, uh, don't uh, require um, uh, what I was thinking to respond in terms of just one slide where I've made certain points. Uh, so, anyway, she's it's come here now. Yeah, uh, uh, here. So uh, the point on implementation, uh, which was very effectively highlighted by Mr. Nambiar, this actually is something which is extremely important when you want to achieve change through policy. Because we think of policy 
as announcement of policies rather than implementation of policies. And uh, your point about the uh, center and state is very important, but uh, it's uh, the speech which uh, the Prime Minister uh, gave on 6th August 2021 is very, very substantive. He talks not only of center and state, but center, state, and the private sector walking hand in hand. So the, the uh, and feedback. What the other countries which are successful is, they actually monitor in consultation with the, the policy makers, monitor what is the impact of policy with those who are the subject to that policy, where are the gaps, which, what are the reasons for those gaps. It may be state policy, it may be the fact that something is not understood properly by the policy maker or by the, the uh, entity subject to it. So this is a very, very important issue. You gave a few examples. Without this, in fact, the, the lesson of industrial policy is if you want to succeed, you must monitor, you must identify gaps and address them in a timely manner on a consistent basis. So that's, that's one. Second, uh, you all successful nations actually have a strategic approach to policy. India does not. In fact, every year, it's, it's interesting to talk to major exporters that they are on tenter hooks on the end of January because some tariffs will be announced which, which will just change the playing field. And they have got uh, business plans, uh, they have got linked uh, contracts with people and the moment the playing field changes, it, their, their game is, 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 uh, uh, is impacted in, in a positive way sometimes and in a major negative way. Third, scale of operation is, it was asked, how do you achieve that? Actually, the most important thing about scale of operation is which policy regime do you keep in place? Scale of operation requires high investment. High investment will not take place unless you give stability and predictability of the policy. I have just given you one example of lack of stability. There are several others. You have to create that. Second, you have to create a system which operates for large operations of global value chain. For example, China and Vietnam they allow for warehouses with inputs to be kept on their regime, uh, in their territory, without any taxes. So that when there is a problem, the, these inputs can be provided to the domestic large players or they can be exported. In India, we impose a tariff, uh, a tax of 40%. You know, so you have to take a look at what are the policies which are stopping you, who is coming in the way, and therefore the strategy, etc., becomes very important. Implementation is the name of the game. You can have the best policy; it can be a piece of paper. You know. So, uh, in terms of um, the RCEP, I I think that. The key issue which really was a problem for India was a safeguard against China. India, India came out with five different points why it, is, uh, it was a problem for it. But the key issue was uh, uh, safeguard and the fact that you have an aggregated uh, you know, uh, a rule of origin so that China could just send a product to Vietnam and effectively come, it, it would come to India under zero tariff, as it does from Vietnam right now. If India can work, in fact, India focused on this in the last part of RCEP, last part. And it did get a safeguard for six months, which it didn't see as adequate. So even then, the Prime Minister went there, yeah, I mean, the initial thought was, let's sign on because of friendship, because of various other things. 
So, you know, you should be part of an FTA, but it was pointed out that like PLI, you have 13 different PLIs, but they are different policies. The name doesn't mean that it is really a good construct. The fact that it's an FTA, for the countries which are members, they are parts already parts of uh, the value chains, etc., and they they will take it forward. They are not, uh, you know, concerned about it. India does have an issue about China, and if the effort has to be made, then effort has to be made in terms of two things. The larger part is a safeguard measure. And uh, actually, in the uh, TPP negotiations, which US got out of, therefore it's now CPTPP, US and Japan had negotiated a safeguard called snapback. Actually, US had negotiated, where it said, if Japan, you who uses various methods to keep people out of your market in automobiles, I feel that you are actually not providing what I expect you to provide. I will take away all that I have given you. So there was a poison pill. Something creative needs to be done so that India's concern is addressed. It's not just, let's sign on to RCEP. That is not the way to go about it, in my view. I, I'm differently thinking from what most people who are po, uh, pro uh, open trade, and I'm pro open trade, but you have to have the safeguards which you need. So on, uh, on Vijay's, Vijay's question, On trade diversion, you know, th there are studies done on trade diversion, but it's neither here nor there. The issue is, if trade diversion is taking place, how do you equip yourself to address that situation? So uh, I had with some people done a similar kind of study uh, when TPP was being negotiated. and. So, so they were they were creating a new environment of trade with twelve countries, large countries, large uh, set of trade issues. So it was clear that, as far as tariffs are concerned, when they reduce their tariffs and make their common market, so to say, the only way you can uh, fight that, and it it was also clear to me that India can't be part of TPP. The requirements were very onerous. They have 99% zero tariff uh, for uh, non-agriculture non products. So uh, you have to improve your efficiency. The, the main message of my presentation is you need the appropriate policies for efficiency. And efficiency requires a strategic way of thinking together with the right kind of policies, interaction with those who are subject to the policies, monitoring what is the gap and addressing it quickly. It started to happen. Actually, in the mindset, you talked about mindset. I see the mindset changing in several parts of government. And it started to happen. The best example is the way the DGFT is implementing the e-commerce. Uh, initiatives. They are going to districts and identifying what it needs to be done. But it's a, it's a small little, it's a stone in the, in the pond, so to say. So the studies are there, but studies will only give you an insight. It, the answer is, is clear even without the study. There will be trade diversion. So you have to improve your efficiency. The largest part for me was that they would have created their own environment of their standards, which would become global standards. Therefore, we have to upgrade our standards capabilities. That is what, uh, you know, Rajiv Kher was Commerce Secretary that time. We discussed it, and the standards conclave was launched. And it did very well for some time. 
So we have to actually work on upgrading capabilities, up, uh, identifying what are the key standards, and that's where the operating conditions are changing in GVCs with the due diligence which the Germans are bringing in, etc. So you have to keep running like Alice in Wonderland to faster and faster to be in the safe, same place. But you have to be alert and you have to have those institutions. And that is something which needs to be done. And it links up with the domestic efforts which are needed. Hmm? On uh, Vijay's question, It's a very difficult question. I'll tell you why. Because people, different countries have different perceptions about what is strengthening the, of the multilateral trading system. In the context of US and large extent EU, it is moving the, the set of rules to a, a new level, which their industries want. And as far as India is concerned, it is facing a problem because on its own, it doesn't have the strength like US and EU to push through positions. It has to have coalitions. And when you have to have, when you need that, you also need to emphasize the, uh, the interests of the coalition partners who may leave you completely at the end of the game. But you have to come with that kind of negotiating strength. So, and, and in philosophically, India actually feels uh, concern and sympathy for the concerns of the poorer countries, the, uh, the uh, various groupings which are there with different perspectives. So, India actually now there is a stark contrast and the key difference is key difference is that the large countries like e us and eu feel that countries like china india they are now more developed than they were they should take on larger obligations which these countries say we still have a large development burden and you should not ask us to do this if that can be bridged, I think the system can be healed. But that doesn't seem like it will be bridged. The second problem which has arisen in the system, which India cannot address really, is how to address the concerns which arise because of the non-market practices of China. So that is something which uh, Japan, EU, and US have been trying to come out with or in terms of solutions, there are ways to go about it. Uh, there are structures which can be done, but adequate thought is not being given to that. Uh, I've written on this actually, how to try and address this, etc. But you need to carry China along with you. Uh, you remember you and I had done an op-ed where tariff-free world was envisaged. I discussed that with the Chinese ambassador, and he was very excited. He said, I would be happy to do that. Will India agree? <laughs> and what we had said was, let's not think of zero tariffs now. Let's think of going to that in 25 years, in the following uh, manner, in a structured stepwise fashion. We have to really give thought to how to go to a world which is emerging uh, through FTAs, etc., in a way that we can be more e efficient. We, are, we have just finished some work on the ta tariffs on inputs uh, on for the key inputs which go into a mobile phone. Just the tariffs themselves, Indian, the difference in Vietnam and China, they lead to cost of production of Indian mobile phones increasing by about 6%. So it makes sense at least to reduce those. So let's do that thinking. That's what strategic approach is all about. One, one question to you, Pradeep. You know, one of the big issues in competition policy today is digital. 
and that is something which you need to take into account because it's it's a question mark in many places india is now working on an, an act and uh, but the issues involved are very different from normal competition yeah uh, uh thank you thank you very much let me uh respond to harsh on the digital and which also responds to dr ganguly's comments dr ganguly uh, i think as anybody knows in this audience when you're given 20 minutes you can't speak about the whole earth number one number two i i could not have spoken about the polemics of competition policy my remit was very clear as to what is the experience we have in india and what is it that should be done in terms of what kind of recommendations political parties should get and that is what my my remit was very clear and we can talk about competition policy for the whole day and i may not even need any notes so uh, <laughs> let's not get into that now harsh has pointed out a very right thing in terms of digital economy it's one of the big sort of a big elephant in the room and it's like you know five blind men don't knowing you know what is the tail or what is the trunk and what is the leg honestly the whole world is struggling and before you can deal with digital 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 tech which is going bigger and bigger you suddenly have new things called gpt and ai and things like you know all that which is coming which is absolutely mind boggling and papers and reams are being written about it with little little guidance as to you know what uh, what is it that we can do because there is such a lot of uncertainty in this area uh, has you know you can't imagine the uncertainty is so high what will happen tomorrow we don't know now you have conferences you and i can go through our avatars it's already happening in india i and you don't have to be here in pune but we can speak uh, with our own selves here and interact with people also that has happened in india so <coughs> what i'm saying is be less be aware about the kind of the new frontiers we are looking at it's just now the digital marketing act which the parliament has drafted etc and what we have said is that look it's uh, the the as i said i mean the field is evolving so fast that before you can say jack robinson you would have missed the bus new things would have come as it is the competition act is competent to deal with it, it is fairly elaborate fairly comprehensive what you require is the right kind of manpower we still are doing the competition commission has now set up a department on digital economy and how they are going to progress in terms of getting the kind of brains uh, at the kind of government salaries that they have is the challenge that's going to be a challenge but yet uh, in spite of low salary scales we still find a lot of people going in for government jobs because of the prestige or the satisfaction that they get and we are also getting a brain gain large number of our uh, uh, Indians who are abroad in USA, etc., wanting to come back if they are able to get the right kind of job, so we can do that. Now, <clears throat> let me go to Arshep and speak some facts, which, of course, uh, Harsh will not speak about uh, because he he works closely with the government. Arshep uh, was, you know, one of the most peculiar things that the Prime Minister lands in Bangkok to sign the declaration and doesn't sign it. Have you ever heard of any instance where a head of government goes to a particular summit and says, "I'm not going to sign"? The most peculiar uh, experiences. Now, apparently, the prime minister was convinced by Hardeep Puri. Hardeep Puri at that time was minister of state for commerce, and Piyush Goel was the minister for commerce and industries. Piyush did not want it. Not only that, Jay Shankar also didn't want it. I said. both of them belong to the steel lobby sajjan jindal and tata steel and they were afraid about competition from china this is this is a fact which one has gathered from inside not only one source but at least three sources and i believe it is credible now as it is has why why do to say that today our china is our biggest trading partner even today without an agreement gravity you get the right kind of goods from them at a low cost and those you continue to import they keep on blocking our exports and that is a big problem that we have to deal with because they you know there's sort of opaque standards opaque so and so now what you spoke about in terms of standards has is very good now there again 
a political economy in our country is that the Bureau of Indian Standards is just incompetent institution. We deal with them. We deal with them and we, unless we overhaul that institution, we will not be able to kind of de deal with these standards. And <coughs> it's, an, it's an absolutely essential thing what you said. What Rajiv here started has not ended, unfortunately. We are still in the same kind of position. And the new, uh, the new departmental uh, officers also have very little idea about it. That is the other problem of our system. We keep on getting people coming from different branches, somebody from animal husbandry, somebody from fisheries, landing up in the trade policy, little knowing, uh, you know, we don't have that continuity also. So that also creates a problem. One very good example of that I must tell you. Indian exports of whiskey face a lot of problems. Because at the time of negotiation, we could not negotiate the look. We, India made, can have molasses-based whiskey also in the, uh, in the schedule. And what then Commerce Secretary Gopal Pillai told me, the fellow who was negotiating was probably a teetotaler. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he didn't push for that. Otherwise, we, we can have a big market for the Indian molasses-based whiskey also. But we, sorry? EU. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I, I, there are various such uh, episodes. But RCEP, particularly, I personally feel, and we've written about it also, that we should get into it. Now, in TPP also, Harsh, what you did not mention is something very important. Vietnam has got very long, uh, uh, you know, built-in agenda because it cannot compare itself with the other risk partners. So you can have a long built-in agenda if you had negotiated it. I agree that six months for a safeguard is nothing. I mean, you could have built-in sort of longer-term agenda for whatever concession that you would seek. How are negotiators are doing it, I, I don't know. I mean, there, is a, there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, shady, uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of murk in it which I can speak to you on a one-to-one -one basis. <laughs> and you must be knowing some of them. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to request. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ganguly, thank you for your uh, comments. Actually, the thought which struck me when you were giving your comments is that competition, the purpose of competition policy is to address lack of competition. And there are multiple objectives which may be important, but you need other instruments to address that. I mean, you can't uh, achieve everything through just one instrument. So that is important. On uh, Pradeep, your, your point, uh, actually the issue is far more complex than just steel. No, I know. Yeah. No, I, I and, uh, and the yeah, there were multiple issues, but the key issue, and I was involved in an effort in the last phase to try and see what could be developed so, so to give the uh, the safeguard because uh, the political message uh, in the entire cabinet was that this will hurt us politically as well as economically but still the decision that was taken uh, at the, uh, the cabinet level was that we will actually take part in it and then the last moment things turned uh, the uh, the negotiators, I talked to some other negotiators also in RCEP, and some of them said that if India doesn't agree, we will just go go forward on our own, which they did. And keep a window open for India. No, that Japan did. Ah. Uh, so, you know, let's not get into Japan details. Uh, let's not get into details in, in this, because the whole point is that India does not seek the kind of FTA with China because it does not see China as the negotiating partner or trading partner who plays by the rules. That's what's now addressing, affecting WTO. So it's not a simple thing about steel or some other thing. You needed that. Uh, safeguard. India tried very hard to get it, but it did not. So that's that's where I come from. That you need that. If you get that, 
this is a very good way of linking up even closer with the Asian value chains, the regional value chains. So uh, it, you can ask for something, but others may not agree, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, just 30 second response to Dr. Ganguly. Uh, you know, you have spoken about global competition. One is the issue came up over anti-dumping, which is, of course, not a desirable instrument, but yet there is a Secondly, and importantly, the new competition, the old competition law has extraterritorial jurisdiction. So we can challenge a merger happening between U.S. and Ukrainian company, which has an impact on the Indian market. But we still don't have that kind of maturity in our competition authority to be able to deal with that. But legally, we are empowered. China has been doing it. China has used its extraterritorial jurisdiction, for example, in one very famous case which impacts us also, the potash cartel. They have stopped a, a Belarusian company and another company from merging because it has an impact on the Chinese market. What they could get away with was to get a price undertaking that we will not increase the price. India did not. We told Indian Competition Authority, you should also intervene. You are empowered. You did not. But I suppose they were hesitant, they were shy, they didn't have the capacity. <coughs> well, uh, in the interest of uh, observing timelines, I think uh, we will uh, bring the session very shortly to a close. Uh, before I take the liberty of offering my own very quick uh, two comments, which are really in the nature of flagging two issues. Uh, let me take this opportunity to profusely thank Dr. Harshwardhan Singh as well as Mr. Pradeep Mehta for their very comprehensive uh, and insightful presentations. Uh, it was a very absorbing and indeed an educative uh, sort of session for most of us. And uh, for both being stalwarts and veterans in their respective fields, being in Pune, I am tempted to use the word diggaj. Uh, so both uh, these um, uh, stalwarts were there who made these excellent presentations. I also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Nambiar as well as Dr. Arpan for their very insightful and thought-provoking observations. And I also take the opportunity to thank the participants who came up with uh, raising some pertinent issues. I just want to... Uh, flag just uh, two issues uh, for uh, your consideration and without any elaboration in the interest of uh, time. <coughs> One is, of course, um, uh, Dr. Harshavardhan Singh uh, mentioned uh, about GVCs and indeed GVCs is the name of the you know, game today. How, however, as far as India is concerned, um, there is a growing opinion within India and also overseas in some of the l recent uh, international reports that India's relative or competitive advantage may lie more in the intermediate services as far as GVCs are concerned, whether it is engineering, design, R&D, etc. So vis-a-vis -vis manufacturing, whether India um, that India should participate increasingly in GVCs is, of course, a no-brainer. OECD uh, index in 2019 has said that India is very low, as you rightly said, in the GVC participation index. But the way forward, in other words, for me is more perhaps through services. So that's one point. And one final point is that we are talking about convergence of policies, etc. So uh, in that context, I would just uh, um, say that are we also do we need to think in terms of an integrated policy framework which combines trade policy, industrial policy, FDI policy, so that the GVC question can be addressed. Otherwise, we tend to work in silos, that is, FDI raise some limit or open some sector. But do, does that help us in, say, negotiating with other countries in FTAs? Are we concentrating on that kind of FDI which will you know, enhance Indian industry's participation in GVC, etc. So, can we think of an integrated uh, policy framework? So, that's, these are the two issues which I wanted to flag. I once again take the opportunity to thank the participants. I also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Vijay Kerkar, Vishal Gaikwad and the PIC for giving me this opportunity. 
to uh, chair a session of, uh, in which I am honestly quite humbled in the presence of these uh, two stalwarts. So thank you very much.